We'll be opening up the word in uh, Revelation 19, verses 1 through 10. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, who, you who fear him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her the clothe herself, to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who build to the testimony of Jesus. Worship for the servant of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Thank you, Daniel, for sharing the scripture and a little bit of enthusiasm there. Hallelujah is a great word. We're going to learn a little bit about it this morning as we come back to the book of Revelation. And it's been a couple of weeks because we missed last Sunday due to the storm. We're really glad that you're here this morning and, and have this opportunity to, to be in the Word of God and trust that will cause us to grow in Christ. Let's bow for prayer, shall we? Father, thank you for bringing us here this morning, allowing us to be together in this place. Thank you, Lord, for those that have been here for years and some that may be here for the first time. Would you help each one to feel welcome, to be loved and cared for? And Father, we come here because... Lord, we don't, need, we don't really need to hear the singing. We don't even need to hear the sermon. But, Lord, we do need to connect with you. And I pray that you'd allow that to happen. You'd open up our hearts and minds through the singing and through the preaching of the word. Lord, that we learn of you. Our hearts would respond to you. I trust in a positive way. Lord, that you would give us the desire in our hearts to lift up your name, to sing alleluia, to praise and glorify you. Father, we thank you. Uh, some people have got great news this week. We thank you that, that Nick found out, Lord, that, that he's cancer-free still, and we rejoice with him. And others, Lord, are battling cancer. Would you please put your hand mightily upon them? Think of Betty Hartwright, Lord, that will have surgery this Tuesday, and we pray for skill for the hands of the surgeon, Lord, that you would give her the physical strength to endure, and pray, Lord, that you might rid her body of cancer and bring her back to health and strength. Lord, I'm sure there's a multitude this morning that I'm forgetting, but Lord, you don't. And we pray that you'd reach out and touch this body of believers and encourage and strengthen and be to them all that they need. We know that, Lord, you are sufficient. Father, we, we rejoice in Christ our Savior. And we thank you that, Lord, we can come to this book of Revelation with its message that's sometimes confusing and sometimes difficult to understand. And yet, Lord, you have given us understanding and given us cause to rejoice and at other times cause to tremble. This morning, help us to rejoice with you at the word of God that's true and faithful. And Lord, we can receive it to our benefit. In Christ's name, amen. Just uh, want to say thank you. Mary and I were away Thursday, Friday, and Saturday morning to a pastor and wives retreat. And we thank you that you allow us to do that. It's just a time we get together with a bunch of other pastors and their wives. There's about somewhere between 35 and 40 there, I guess, all together. And uh, just a good time of fellowship. Uh, although I came down with a cold and spent much of Friday just in my bed in the motel room. And I'm still battling that. So if I didn't go around and shake your hand this morning, uh, I just don't want to pass it on to you, all right? And uh, if I do go to the door this morning, I probably won't shake your hand. And I'm not being mean, just trying to be nice to you. Uh, you don't need this bug, believe me. 
And uh, God's good, though, isn't he? He's good to bring us together here. He's good every day, and he's good in every way. Great, faithful Lord. We've been going through this book of Revelation, and you probably sensed a couple of weeks ago that I was a little bit tired of preaching about the judgments. You know, the seals and the trumpets and the bowls and chapter 17 and 18 about God bringing that Babylonian kingdom and the harlot down and the commercial kingdom was going to come crashing down and uh, we see all of that. We're, we're kind of at a turning point. There's, all the bad stuff isn't over yet because you've got the great white throne judgment, some of that stuff to go through. But we're, we're in, in the book of Revelation this morning, we're going up to heaven, all right? We're going to see a, a glorious scene in heaven, and, and the church is going to reappear. I don't know if you've noticed it, and we've tried to point it out to you, but from chapter 4 on through chapter 19, there's no mention of the church. In chapter 4, he says, come up hither, and here we're going to see that great scene of the marriage supper of the Lamb. But in between, the church is not there. We see about the tribulation saints. Uh, we read about the beast and antichrist and all of that. But uh, the church has been largely absent. But the church is back. And, and we're coming to that moment where Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you. And, and when I get it ready, I'm, I'm going to come and receive you unto myself. And so we've, we've reached that moment, a glorious moment. And how many of you like weddings? Well, I like mine. I've never cared much for anybody else's, but I really like mine, you know, and, and my beautiful bride. And, and I remember, you know, that day when, when she looked at me and said, you know, would you marry me? And, and you, you think that's a joke, but it wasn't. And she forwarded it this way. She said, have you ever thought about marrying me? And, and I understand that because we've been dating about four years at the time, you know. And uh, then I remember going out and, and buying that that diamond ring. Uh, there used to be a jewelry store over on the other side of the river downtown called Chippins. And, and Chippins is sort of associated with cheap, I think. That's why we went there, because I couldn't afford very much. I was in Bible school. And uh, we were engaged uh, during our second year of Bible school and got married and went back for my third year and, and so on. But, but weddings, I, I, I remember my wife coming through that back door and starting down the, the aisle and I'm up here on the platform, and I'm nervous, and she's shaking. I thought all the petals were going to fall off her roses. But I got to tell you, I never saw in my life before or since anything that looks so beautiful. When we get to heaven, we're going to see a scene much like that, only things are going to be reversed a little bit. The one that's so beautiful is not going to be the bride. Oh, she'll be beautiful. But the one that we will have eyes for will be the bridegroom, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's sort of what we're talking about in the first 10 verses of Revelation chapter 19 this morning. We're going to talk about the participants. We're going to look at the beautiful bride, the anticipation and the preparation and the celebration that goes on and so on. It's, it's, it's all to do with this. I, I heard of a... a Bride and groom was stood at the altar, and it was name was John Doe. We'll just use that name. And uh, John Doe, on his wedding day, was the most excited creature. He handed his wife the marriage fee and tried to kiss the preacher. I I never had that happen, but I guess it it probably could if you got that nervous when you're standing there. And uh, uh, but this is going to be a wedding. I want to tell you, a wedding to end all weddings. Literally, there will never be another wedding after this wedding. After this marriage, supper of the Lamb, that's it. We're just married to him, and we're going to enjoy him forever for all of eternity. And yes, the bride will be beautiful, and we're going to, we're going to talk about how that bride gets beautiful. Uh, the bride is the church, right? And how do we get to the place where we're beautiful as we walk towards the Lord Jesus and embrace him on that great wedding day? And uh, one of the great things about this wedding is this side of heaven, that every joy that we enter into is, is always shadowed by some difficult things, isn't it? Like we know it's either come or it's coming and, and shadowed in, in grief, 
But from this moment on, for the child of God, there will be no more grief whatsoever as we enter into this marriage relationship with our Lord and Savior. There's going to be this glorious anticipation of that moment. By the way, you know when you have a wedding and, and, and they're playing the prelude, it's all meant to build that anticipation of what's to take place. And, and you, you sit there at a wedding and, and there's just a buzz, isn't there? There's kind of an excitement. Uh, people don't sit there like they do in church, you know, sort of half asleep. They're just alive, and, and, and I think that's going to be there on that day. It's just going to be a glorious, wonderful time, and uh, if you're a believer, it's the moment that we've all been waiting for, isn't it? I mean, that is the moment you're waiting for, right? The sad thing is, we, we think about this marriage supper of the Lamb, and we think about going to heaven someday, and the tragedy is... Most Christians don't live with anticipation of that. We are so entwined with, we are so longing for what we've got here, we don't ever want to leave it. And we don't give much thought. We don't even hear a lot of sermons about heaven and how wonderful and glorious it's going to be. We, we just kind of say, well, we don't really know much about it. Well, actually, the Bible says quite a bit about it. And in the coming weeks, we're going to be learning more and more about heaven. We're going to take some time as we get into those final chapters, to learn a little bit about heaven, hopefully to whet your appetite. I, I can't hardly believe it that we don't want to know more about heaven. Uh, you ought to be beating my door down and say, Pastor, tell us about heaven. If, if we were, you and I were astronauts, and we're going to take the first trip to Mars, what would you do? You'd want to do all the research you could and learn everything that possible to know about Mars, wouldn't you? If I'm going there, you wouldn't, you wouldn't step into the spaceship and somebody says, well, what do you know about Mars? Well, I don't know much, just, you know, I'm going to go and find out. No, we, we want to know things ahead of time. If, if uh, my wife and I are going on vacation somewhere, we, we want to check it out. We want to get some details on what to expect and what to plan for, don't we? You don't. You're a hard audience this morning. I hope you know that. You missed a week and, and you just went stone cold. If I was going to Mars, I'd research. I want to know everything. And, and I want to know about heaven. And We're just going to get an initial glimpse that sort of switches us from all these judgments and, and begin to look at, at this moment. It, it sort of bridges chapter 18 over to chapter 20 and 21 and 22 as we look at all of this. And there's this the first thing that Daniel read about there, and, and he emphasized, was that there's, there's this anthem that goes up of hallelujah, hallelujah to the Lord. And hallelujah is really from two words, halle, which means to praise, and Yahweh, or Yah, which means Jehovah. So it literally means praise Jehovah or praise God. And so every time that we say or we sing the word hallelujah, what are we saying? Praise God. It, we're going, we're going to say that in heaven. Did you know that? Let's practice a little bit. Hallelujah. 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 It's, it's all right, isn't it? I'm just trying to clear my throat. but I can tell you're excited. I'm not covering... The whole chapter of 19 here this morning for two reasons. One, I don't have time. And two, the last half of the chapter isn't near as good as the first half. The first half, there's a, there's a feast called the Merry Supper of the Lamb. But you're going to realize that there's another feast in the last half of this chapter. I won't get into that. You can read ahead and if you want to, just not while I'm preaching. And, and, but there's two feasts that are here. And you need to decide which one do I want to be at. Because the first feast is the Merry Supper of the Lamb. You get the feast. The second feast is of those that have been in rebellion against God, and they're going to be feasted on by the birds of the air and the fowl and so on. So you need to decide which of those feasts do I want to be at. I, I've already made my decision. I'd rather be eaten than, be, than being eaten. And uh, so we see that laid out here in this chapter. And, and it's, if you look at the end of chapter 18... It says this, and in her was found the blood 
of the prophets and the saints and of all who were slain on the earth. So we ended chapter 18 with those that had been slain. It's kind of a nasty picture, but it says, After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. There's just this great anthem of praise that begins to go up to God. And if you read that carefully, you find out that there's, there's four sets of alleluias that are there. And they all represent a truth that, that I want you to see as we come to this particular passage this morning and, and look at this uh, wedding scene that's before us. And the first thing I want to note for you is that the, the, the music here is just going to be absolutely magnificent. And it's intended... These hallelujahs are intended to build our anticipation for this great moment when our bridegroom appears and we see him and are are caught uh, up to be with him, if you will. And uh, we're going to hear this great uh, song, this great shout. And uh, what, what I like is that it says it's the sound of a great multitude. We often think, because the scripture says broad is the way that leads to destruction, and narrow is the way that leads to heaven, and few there be that find it. How many of you have got the idea there's just going to be a little handful of people that's going to be in heaven? Well, you're wrong. There's going to be a great multitude of people that are saved from all the ages and redeemed from every tongue and tribe of nation on the earth, and we're going to be together, Old Testament saints, New Testament saints, tribulation saints, lifting our voices in praise to glorify the great God of heaven. What a day this is going to be. And so we, we look at this here and the, the anticipation of what we see and the hallelujahs that are lifted up. The first hallelujah that we come to in this particular passage is for the saving work of God. He's, he's, he says, hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power. You see, the, the kingdom we've just talked about, the kingdom of the beast and the antichrist, the Babylon, Babylon was about killing and destruction and destroying. But our God's about what? He's about salvation. He's about redemption. And this is a song of redemption. If we're redeemed, we ought to want to just shout out hallelujah and praise to God for who he is and what he's given to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank him for what kind of salvation? The Bible says so great salvation. Don't neglect so great a salvation. Don't neglect it. Don't avoid it. Don't reject it. Come to this salvation that God has made possible and available for you in the person of Jesus Christ. Babylon lies now in waste. If you've chosen to follow that kingdom and live for the world and worldliness that we talked about, that's all over. And there's no more enjoyment for those that chose that to be their God, their idol, if you will, in life. Instead, we, we come to this passage. Scripture says salvation, and because of salvation, glory and honor and power belong to who? They belong to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And may I say this, him alone. You're going to find later on that John bows down to worship the angel that brought the message about the destruction of Babylon and, and, and of the, the Mary Supper of the Lamb and all this. He He falsely goes to worship him and is told not to do that. He just got so caught up in it that he was going to do that, but he's told not to. Why? Because there's only one that we're to worship, and his name is Jesus. Worship Jesus. And there's going to be much people that are going to join in this. And and there's a reason given here. It says, for true and righteous are his judgments. True and righteous. And righteous. I don't know if you've ever stopped to think about that, but his judgments are what? When he makes a judgment, do you know down here we make mistakes sometimes? I was I was reading about a judgment down in Bristol, Tennessee, where a family had gone on vacation and a thief had come in to broke into their home, robbed their home, and decided to leave through the garage. But he went into the garage and somehow He couldn't get the door up, and then he couldn't get back into the house, and he was trapped in there for eight days. He couldn't get out. And finally, the family came back 
found him in there in bad condition and you know, got an ambulance to come and get him and so on. And a few days later, they found out that he was suing them for not leaving any food in the garage or any water, and he had to eat dog food and he had nothing to drink. And they took that to court, and the court gave him a settlement of $535,000. So if you want to trap me in your garage for a week, I'm available. (laughs) That will never happen in the courtroom of King Jesus. His judgments are true and righteous altogether. There will be no false judgments there. They will be in in accord with everything as it ought to be. They will be in in accord with the law of God. There will be no deviation whatsoever from the standard that God has set. A standard of what? Perfection. Righteous judgment. There will be a judgment with, if they're true and righteous, there's, there's no deviation in that whatsoever. There's no falsehood in his judgment. His judgments are, what are they? True and righteous. The judgments of God. Is is that a reason to rejoice? Have you ever seen injustices being done? When when people are trying to do righteousness and they they get in trouble, they they get arrested and everything, you know, they're carrying a placard, fighting against abortion, and they get arrested, and the criminals get to go free and continue carrying on their sin and all those things that, that go on in our world. Listen, when King Jesus takes over, and that's what this is all about, isn't it? He's coming to rule and to reign. And and the beginning of that is the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so that's why it's important that we we study this and learn about this. And (coughs) he says, look at uh, chapter 19, verse 2 says, True and righteous are his judgment because he has judged the great harlot. He's judged. We read about that chapter 17 and 18. So I want to go back and dwell on that this morning. But notice what the harlot did, who corrupted the earth with her fornication. Harlots do that. They corrupt. When a man goes into a harlot, he's going to try and get out of a relationship with a harlot that he pays for what can only be rightly found in a true and proper marriage relationship, right? He's corrupting the good thing that God provides in marriage and a relationship between a husband and a wife. And he continues to do that today. But the day's coming when the corruption's over. The harlot who corrupts will be what? She's going to be done in. (laughs) Her business is over. No more of that going on because true and righteous are the judgments of God that he brings to planet earth. And so we rejoice and we praise in God because of what he does. And, and we're going to sing hallelujah, 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 Lord, for your goodness, for your redemption, for your righteous judgments. And then he says we're going to sing hallelujah. He says And he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Again, they said, Alleluia. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. That's the Alleluia. If the first Alleluia is the Alleluia of redemption, the second Alleluia is the Alleluia of retribution. We're going to rejoice in the severity of the work of God. Now, we find that hard, don't we? To think about people being judged eternally, We find it hard because we know what sinners we are. But you have to understand that we'll never enter into the joy that we're supposed to enter into until all unrighteousness has been judged and brought to an end. And so that's the reason. We don't rejoice that an individual is going to hell. We rejoice that God has been proved to be God. He's faithful and true. We rejoice not at the things but at the person of the Lord. And so we're going to rejoice that he's put down this corrupt system. He's defeated the beast and the antichrist. It's interesting. Proverbs chapter 11 verse 10 says, when the wicked perish, there are shouts of gladness. When a wicked man is brought down, you know, if somebody's gone out and shot a bunch of police officers and then they shoot him, there's a sense of what? Justice has been done. Righteousness has been looked after. And there's a sense, we don't clap our hands and jump up and down, but there's a sense of rejoicing. The criminal has been caught. He's going to pay the price. And that's the sense that we see here in this particular chapter as we see the hand 
But I just want to remind you again that God's hand, when it comes against the sinner, will be severe. There is retribution. There is a place called hell. I don't like talking about it. I, I don't rejoice in saying that there is a place of punishment. But I do know this, that that's what God tells us about over and over again in this word, that there is a place of punishment. And what we need to learn is that vengeance isn't wrong. Some of you are saying, oh, I like that. I've got some people I'd like to take vengeance against. No, vengeance isn't wrong when it's in the hands of God. You see, the Bible teaches you again and again, don't take vengeance into your own hands, right? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. We're leaving it all over to him to right every wrong, and that's what it tells us here. That's what he's going to do. He's going to right every wrong that's been done. People come to me and say, oh, this happened to me, and this happened to me, and that was unjust, and that was unfair. How could Job lose all that he, he lost and, and seem so unfair and unjust? How could he say, I think it was Evie that said this morning, right, that he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to worship God. I'm going to praise God. How? Why? Because he knows that in the end, God's going to bring it all together. He's going to balance the books, and all, every wrong that's ever been done to you will be made right. That's the true and righteous judgments. And so we rejoice at the retribution that God's going to bring. And so the crowd there will cry out, and it says, because the smoke of her torment. I want you to understand the place of torment is real. There's fire. There is suffering that's going to come for those that reject the Lord and fight against him. And it says there very clearly, it's not talking about annihilation. It says the smoke rises up forever and what? What's the word? Forever and forever. And that's somber. It's sobering. And I'm only preaching it to you because that's what it says. This isn't a Baptist doctrine. This is a Bible doctrine that I'm trying to lay out for you this morning. That ought to put a fire inside of you. It ought to put a fire inside of me to do everything we can. If we've got an unsaved family member, an unsaved relative, an unsaved neighbor, an unsaved coworker, somebody that you play hockey with, the burden upon our hearts is that we want to share with them what? The gospel of Jesus Christ so they can be redeemed. They can be forgiven. They don't have to be forever in this place of torment where the smoke arises forever and ever. They can be in a part of this group that's going to be there at the marriage supper of the Lamb with the Lord Jesus. And, and so God says here, let the party begin. Hallelujah for salvation. Hallelujah that unrighteousness has been dealt with and judged and the wicked are going to be brought down. And then there's a, a fourth hallelujah. Look at verse 4 here, <clears throat> or a third hallelujah here, verse 4. And the 20, uh, 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen, hallelujah. And there came a voice from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. If you're a servant of God this morning, you've got cause to do what? To shout, hallelujah. Why? Because here's this God, and it talks about him. He sits on a throne, and over and over, we said there were four words that you need to look for in the, in the verse, or, uh, as you go through Revelation. One of those was a throne. And every time we gather around the throne, what has that scene been? It's been a scene of worship. We worship at the throne. Why? Because we've got a right relationship with the one that's on the throne. You're not only going to worship him if you're in a right relationship. You're not going to worship him if you're not. So he's talking about people coming around the throne that are in a right relationship. Who sits on a throne? King. He's sovereign. So this is the hallelujah that's about the sovereignty of God, the one that's in control of the universe. This is the psalm. The, the song that we sing because we're in a right relationship with him. That's possible because God chooses. God's word for relationship is what? It's covenant. And we know about the old covenant with the law. And then the new covenant has to do with this new relationship that we have with God through his son, Jesus Christ. 
that was made possible because he went to the cross, took our sins upon himself, bore the wrath of, of God against that sin. He bore the judgment of God in his own body, was dead, was buried, and then what? Rose up from the grave. That's good news. And because of that, a sinner like me, a sinner like you, can come into a right relationship with a holy God, a covenant relationship based on the shed blood of the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. What glorious news that is. That's cause for rejoicing and celebration in the Lord, the sovereignty of God. The question it begs here is this, are you his servant? If I followed you around for the last week, would, would there be evidence there that you're a servant of God? That you've actually done something to serve him with your life. That there's, there's evidence. There, there should be, shouldn't there? The Bible says, we've learned about this in Philippians, that he which hath begun a good work in you will what? He's going to continue it and he's going to finish it. That God, if you're a genuine believer in Jesus Christ, is at work in you. But it begs the question, is there any evidence? If I asked you going out the door this morning, where is God at work in you? Can you put your finger on that? Do you know? Yes, God's at work here in my life. He's at work here. He's at work in this thing in my life. He's at work in my marriage. He's at work in my relationship with my kids. He's at work, I hope, in my relationship with the deacons. God ought to be at work in a lot of areas in your life because you need a lot of work just like I do, right? Amen? So you need to know. He, he tells us that we've been saved because God doesn't want to leave us where we are. He wants to change us and transform us. And, and again, we're going to see that as we look at the bride here and some of the changes and the things that God wants to do in our lives. And lastly, he gives an hallelujah in verses, uh, verse 6 here. He says, and I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, not a few again, but a multitude, as the sound of many waters. You ever been to Niagara Falls or some other big falls where the water is just coming over and there's what? There's just this roar. I, I sort of picture that when I read this. And, and I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as a sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia. Why? For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. This is the hallelujah about the reign of God in our lives. And he's going to be king and he's going to rule and reign over planet earth. And we read about that back in Isaiah and other portions of scripture, how he's coming. And, and so we, we worship him. We shout hallelujah for the redemption of God. We shout hallelujah for the retribution and judgment of God. We shout hallelujah because we're in relationship with this God, a right relationship and we shout hallelujah because of the supreme worth of God. He's worthy to be what? To be praised. He reigns. And we are his loyal subjects, or we ought to be, faithfully serving him and following him. And so we see this scene of anticipation where the music is so wonderful and the hallelujahs are being shouted to God. And, and then beginning in verse 7, we read this. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife, or the bride, has made herself ready. And to her was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So we're coming here to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and in the Old Testament, and during the time of Christ even, the Jews had a certain way that they did marriage. They well, Often it would be the father and mother would come and they'd talk and they'd set up arrangements for a marriage that, you know, maybe the son had said, I kind of like that girl over there. Would you go talk to her family? And so we'd get together. And what happened is that the first stage was we'll enter into what was called the espousal. They were espoused to one another. Remember Mary and Joseph were espoused to be married. Now, when you entered into that espousal, sort of like our engagement period, only it was a little stronger because you had to get a bill of divorcement even to get out of that espousal period. So they became a spouse. Then the groom would go off to prepare a place for his bride. 
often it was just adding on to his parents' house, but, but they go and prepare a place for the bride. In the meantime, the bride had an opportunity to prepare herself to get ready for the coming of the groom, because in a year or so, he would come back, and, and then there would be the consummation of this relationship, and they go off and live, obviously, happily ever after, right? That's how it happens every time. We wish. So I just want to give you sort of what, what's pictured here. And, <clears throat> excuse me, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2, Paul says to the Corinthian believers, I have espoused you to one husband. I have presented you as a chaste virgin unto Christ. Did you know that? If you're a believer here this morning, Chris, you a believer? <laughs> you're a bride. I don't know where your dress is, but we're part of the bride of Christ. What are we supposed to be doing? The bride was supposed to be getting herself ready. She's got a year or so to do it. She's not quite certain when he's going to come back to take her, just like we're not certain when Christ is coming back to catch us to be with him. But he's coming back, and, and we got this job to get ourselves ready. We're the bride of Christ. We're the church. I've, I've done a lot of weddings over the years. I, I think I can honestly say I've never seen an ugly bride. There are a few that just barely made it. <laughs> but when you see that bride dressed in white and she's coming down the aisle, right? There's just something about that. And you, I always like to look over here because nobody else does, and I, I, everybody's looking at the bride. I, I watch sometimes the eyes of the groom, and you just see that little bit of moisture that comes in his eyes. He doesn't want anybody to know that, but, but it often happens as he sees the bride coming towards him, because what has she done? She's been preparing herself, right? She's, in those days, you didn't, you didn't go out and, and buy a dress, and nowadays, they've got to be wash and wear because they plan to use it three or four times. But in that day, the bride got together and she began to prepare herself by, by sewing her own dress. She made it. And because she loved the groom, she wanted to make it as beautiful as possible. And she would sew ornaments and so on. Not, you know, not big ornaments, but little ornaments to her dress to adorn that dress and make it attractive. Isn't it interesting? I was reading in... In, uh, I think it was Titus this week, where it says that, that you and I ought to adorn the gospel of Christ. You ever stop and think about that? Does my life, does your life, is it an adornment to the gospel of Christ? Or do we turn people away from the gospel because we're not an adornment? We're, the sad fact is, The bride, the church of Christ, is an ugly bride. Look in the mirror. We're ugly because there's still so much of sin and unrighteousness in our lives, isn't there? How many of you could say amen to that? You don't have to say it, but just give me some acknowledgement you're still awake. We're an ugly bride. We're, we're not always, we don't, we don't always even with each other say the things we should say, Right? Sometimes we're short-tempered, and sometimes we say things we shouldn't, and yeah, we regret it later, or hopefully we do, but not everything is perfect about this bride at this point. It needs some work. As part of the bride, I need some work. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be, and so God's at work in us going through this process. The beginning of the process, of this wedding process of of coming into relationship, of being a spouse to Christ, is first of all this thing called salvation, where I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I recognize I'm a sinner. I deserve to burn in hell, but God doesn't want me to, and so he sent his son Jesus to die for me, and I embrace him and trust him as my Savior. And, and you know the glorious thing is that he gives me his righteousness and takes my sin. So I have a right standing before God, and then he gives me an engagement ring. Did you know that? The engagement ring is the Holy Spirit. 
He's given to us as the seal of our relationship, much like this wedding ring seals the relationship. And, and he's my guarantee that what? The one that's gone to prepare a place for me, the Lord Jesus, John 14, is going to come and take me to be with him. So I've got this Holy Spirit within me who's already sealed me for that day. And in the meantime, I need to get work on my dress. <laughs> I need to get to work preparing myself for that day when I'll stand before him. Well, how do I do that? Well, one of the first things that you know a bride does on her wedding day is she probably gets up and washes all the muck off her face, right? The sleep in her eyes and... And so you wash it. How does the bride of Christ wash herself? My Bible talks about the washing of the word. It's getting into the word of God. It's memorizing the scripture. It's meditating on the scripture. It's studying the scriptures and letting it wash over us. The Bible talks about abiding in. And the word abide has to do let it wash over and wash over and wash over until it sinks in. And so we need to spend time in the word, allowing it. You know, I've... I'm not saying this to brag, don't, don't think for that reason, but I've read the Bible over 50 times, from cover to cover. And every time I do, I'm ashamed to say it, but there's still little pockets of dirt that every so often he exposes, that's got to go. Why? Because he's getting me ready for that day when he's coming to catch me up to be with himself. He's cleansing me. He's washing me with the water of the word. And, of course, it takes the Spirit of God to help do that, right? He's at work in us, using that word within us and, and to cleanse us. And it's all part of what the Bible calls that process of sanctification. Sanctification is being set apart for God's holy purpose. God's holy purpose, in the end, for you is to be the bride of Christ. So he's getting you ready. He's putting you through a process. If you say this morning, Pastor, have you been saved? Yes but I'm also being saved. And ultimately, I'm going to be saved when he takes me into heaven. I'm in the process of being saved, of washing the dirt away, of cleansing my life, my thought life, my, my activities, my tongue, all of me being cleansed to be a part of this glorious bride of Jesus Christ, awaiting that day that we call the rapture where we're going to be caught up together to be with the Lord. What a day it's going to be. We're not very pretty now. We may be one of the ugliest brides in history at this point. But you know the good news is that Jesus says, I'm doing a work in you. I've begun it. I'm going to finish it. And one day, he says in Ephesians 5, my bride's going to stand before me without spot or wrinkle or pimple or anything else. Blameless in the presence of God. He's going to do this for us. And the sad thing is that a lot of Christians say, well, God's going to do it. We're all going to get there, you know, blameless before the throne. I'll just go out and live my life any old way I want. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that those who have been redeemed, according to 2 Corinthians 5.15, that we've been redeemed so that we no longer live for ourselves. We live unto him who is our Savior. We live for the groom and the day that we're going to be in his presence and so I don't want to continue on in unrighteousness. I want to allow God, I want to cooperate with him with dealing with this in my life. What if Jesus came this morning? Before I finish this message, some of you are saying, please, Lord, please. What if he came? How many of you got some things in your life you say, there would be spots. I couldn't say I'd be without spot or blemish. But he says he's what? He's going to make us spotless without blemish before him. He will accomplish that. But have you ever thought about how it's ultimately accomplished? Because after I'm saved, I'm, I'm created in Christ Jesus unto good works. I'm supposed to do the right things. I'm not saved by doing the right things. I'm saved only by what Jesus did for me. But I'm saved so I'll do the right things in my life, right? Right? I'm trying to think how to shorten this, to be honest. After the rapture, do you know what takes place? 
JCS. Judgment seat of Christ. And here I stand, and frankly right now there's still some dirt there and there's still some pimples, right? I go to the judgment seat of Christ and all my works are, are going to be judged, aren't they? And he says, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, that there's some stuff there in my life that's wood, hay, and stubble. And you touch fire to wood, hay, and stubble, what happens? It's all consumed. It burns up. It's gone. But he says there's also the possibility for us to have gold, silver, and precious stones that withstand the fire, the judgment. And that goes towards the adorning of what? The gown that we wear as part of the bride of Christ. Now, I'm going to try and put this real quick. There's one sense in which I stand there in a gown that's provided for me by Christ. Right? That I'm dressed in his righteousness alone. But Paul, or not Paul, John talks here in the book of Revelation about a gown that's made up of literally the righteous acts of the saints. There is an inner garment that's given to us by Christ. I stand in his righteousness alone. But when I come there that day and I am to have prepared myself a gown that's adorned. Now, depending on how you live your life, I want you to get this. It's sobering. If you've lived your life in such a way that really all your life has been made up of wood, hay, and stubble. Do you know that Jesus says there's going to be those that are ashamed at his appearing? Doesn't he? I want you to know he does. How's that possible? We're going to be ashamed because if all that we have lived for has been of this world and not for his, it's going up in smoke. And frankly, some may stand there in pretty unadorned gowns. So we ought to be doing everything we can to live for Christ and grow in Him and be in the Word and be washed and cleansed and serve the Lord so we can have crowns to lay at His feet, so we can have a wedding garment that's befitting of our groom, the glorious Lord Jesus Christ. I hope when you stand before him that it won't all go up as wood, hay, and stubble, but there will be some gold and silver and pearls and precious stones to adorn your gown as you stand there as a part of the bride of Christ. And I've got to admit, that's sobering for me. And I hope it is somewhat for you. All the things we go through. All the trials. What's God trying to do? He's trying to get out the wrinkles. He's trying to get out the things in our lives that we need to be made aware of. James says that the testing of our faith is it's to produce something in us. It's to produce character and patience and all these things that do what? They adorn the gown, the fruit of the Spirit. Love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness, goodness and faith and meekness and temperance. All of those things, I think, are part of adorning the gown for Christ. Serving the Lord, witnessing, sharing your faith is a part of the adornment that will last. And we'll be dressed appropriately when we stand before our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, unfortunately, I've left myself. I, we've talked about the anticipation. We've talked about the preparation. I don't have much time to talk about the celebration. But it says that in this celebration, there's, there's going to be some guests that are going to come to this, this wedding supper of the Lamb. And he says here, then he said to me, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now listen, that's not you. There are those that come as guests. You say, who are they? I can't say with certainty. I think the angels will be there, but I don't think that's all it's talking about. I think that the Old Testament saints will be there, maybe the tribulation saints, because the bride is specifically made up of those that are the bride of Christ, which is the church. And so they're going to be called. Matter of fact, do you remember Jesus was talking about this? And 
John the Baptist, and, and Jesus said John the Baptist was a friend of the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, they're, they're not the bride, they're what? They're friends that come and join in the celebration when, when the groom comes to take his bride and take her back to the place he's prepared for her, there are the friends of the bridegroom that are there. So I, I think that these friends will include people like John the Baptist. Jesus said that there's none under heaven born among men that's greater than John the Baptist, but he will be the least in the kingdom. Why? Because the bride, the greatness of the bride to Christ, the greatness of my bride, Mary, to me, is only symbolic of the greatness of what the bride of Christ is to Jesus Christ. Do you know this? He loves you. He adores you. He wants to work in you and prepare you and bring you to that place so that you're not ashamed at his coming. You're going to rejoice and be glad. And you've got some sparkling stones in your gown that are worthy and fitting of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. What a day. And great rejoicing among the friends of the bridegroom. And we're going to sit down to consummate this marriage at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, I read some books this week, and they really went into detail about what we're, what's on the menu. Listen, I don't care what's on the menu. That isn't important, and it's all speculation. But I'll tell you what I am interested in is my bridegroom. And when we come to that wedding, you know, we come to a wedding today, and the bride's coming down the back, and all eyes are riveted on her, and we all stand up, right? The heavenly thing's going to be totally different because when our groom comes and every eye is riveted on him, we won't stand up. We'll all fall down to worship our Lord and King, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we're going to do it then, we ought to practice that today, shouldn't we? Just bowing our heads and bowing our hearts before him and bowing our lives before him to worship him. And it says here, verse 9, he said to me, right, blessed are those who are called to the Mary Supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. What he's saying is what you're reading here is it's the word of God. This is not just John talking here. This is the word of God. It's true. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, now he's worshiping the angel. John makes a mistake. He just gets so caught up and moved with emotion here he starts to worship the messenger. Now, I know you wouldn't, but you don't worship me. I did not die for your sin. There's only one that died for your sin and paid the penalty for your sin, and that's Jesus. Worship him. Now, notice what he says here. I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, see that you do not do that. John, don't do that. You're going to get us both in trouble. You shouldn't be doing it. If I allow you to do it, I'm going to be in trouble. He says, I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Two words, what are they? Worship God. Worship God. And then he says, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I'm not going to take the time to explain that for you, but let me just say what it is saying here. It's saying this. When it says worship Jesus, it's telling you that Jesus is who? Jesus is nothing less than God manifest in the flesh. Jesus is God. Don't let those guys come knocking on your door to try to tell you he's something less. He's not anything less. Jesus is to be worshipped. Thomas fell down before him and said, my Lord and my God. And if, if he wasn't his Lord and his God, then Jesus was a sinner because he didn't stop him. The angel here stops John and says, no, don't worship me. I'm not your Lord. Jesus receives the worship because he's what? He's Lord and God and King, and he's going to rule and reign, and he's our glorious bridegroom, and we better be getting ourselves ready for that great and glorious day. Amen? And the beginning step to getting ready is what? Salvation. It's coming to know Christ as our Savior. Believing and acknowledging what God says. You can't save yourself. You can't wash away your sin. You can't do enough good works to climb a ladder to get to heaven. 
That's why Jesus came down and died for you. That's why he took your sin upon himself because you could never pay for it. He paid your debt. And he offers you forgiveness. And he offers you eternal life if you will receive it. He says, as many as received him, to them gave you the power to become the sons of God, to become a part of his family. If you're not part of his family this morning, I beg you, as God's servant this morning, come to Jesus. Come in faith. Come and acknowledge I'm a sinner. My sin deserves a penalty, but Jesus lovingly paid that penalty on the cross. And he arose with eternal life to give me the gift of life. Forgiveness and life is found in Jesus. Come to Jesus. And some of you this morning, you say, I've been saved, saved a long time. But if you looked at your life, you'd have to confess, a lot of my life is just based on living for this world and the things that are in it. And some of you need to make a renewed commitment at least this morning. God, I'm going to live for your kingdom. I'm going to live with that day in my mind. Every bride does, doesn't she? Got that engagement ring on her finger, and and she's just in anticipation. She's planning. She's buying things. She's organizing. All for what? For that day when they're joined together. We as God's people need to get our eyes off of this old world and to get our eyes on to Jesus, our glorious groom, and determine in our hearts and lives, I will live for him. I'm just going to slip down here. Evie's going to come, and we're going to close with one song. But if God spoke to your heart, if you're not saved, just want to encourage you, come take my hand. Say, you know what, preacher? I need to be saved. I need to be born again. I need to find the forgiveness of God. I want a right relationship with him. And walking that aisle won't save you just so you know. But I'll go aside with you in about seven to ten minutes, share with you God's simple plan of salvation. And then you can decide. I'll not force it upon you. You can decide whether you want to pray to receive Christ as your Savior or not. But I want to encourage you today, come to Jesus. And some of you as Christians here today, you need to just come and say, you know what, I've been blowing it. And get down and fall before him at this altar. And say, God, I commit myself to preparing myself to be the bride of Christ. I want to be there in a glorious gown. Not not so it draws attention to me, but because he's worthy of it. I want to live a righteous life. I want to allow God, I want to cooperate with him in this process of sanctifying me and setting me apart for him and his glory. Let's sing, shall we? Let's stand.